Escaped Sapiens. Imagine finding a pristine rainforest that had never before been seen by humans and discovering all sorts of new species completely new to man. It sounds almost impossible in the 21st century, but it turns out that it's not quite. On this episode of the Escape Sapiens podcast, I speak with Julian Bayliss, who is an ecologist and explorer who has discovered eight new species of butterfly, three new species of snake, four species of chameleon, two new species of bats, three species of freshwater crabs, one iris flower, and a frog. It turns out that there are fragmented and isolated forest patches that run all the way down the east coast of Africa, from Ethiopia to Mozambique, and even to South Africa. These are the remnants of what was once a much larger forest, and unfortunately are being destroyed at an alarming rate. Julian has been running expeditions since the early 1990s, searching for intact patches with the goal of saving as much biodiversity as possible. In order to justify the protection of some of the world's rarest species, the first step, of course, is to show that they exist in the first place. I hope you enjoy listening as we discuss Julian's recent expedition to Mount Liko, which guards a small pristine rainforest protected from people by sheer rock walls that are over 700 meters tall. Before beginning, I should mention that we had a few problems with this recording. There are some background artifacts that you might hear, but these mainly clear up around the 10 minute mark. So for those who are sensitive to this sort of thing, I recommend jumping forward uh, to that point. Uh, but for the rest, I decided to keep in uh, the start of the conversation because I find what Julian has to talk about uh, so fascinating. I hope you enjoy. You've been for 20 or 30 years looking into conservation in all, all across Africa, but it looks like you started off as a teacher of, of mathematics and biology. How did you find yourself in conservation and why Africa specifically? Well, yeah, good question. So indeed, at the age of 18, I ended up teaching in a, um, uh, in, a in a black school on the edge of Soweto during apartheid uh, years, 1988-89, and that was my introduction to Africa. Um, it was like a gap year thing, um, and I was there teaching maths and general science. I've always had an interest in nature, I've always had an interest in the natural world, I've always had an interest in conservation. Um, so maths and general science really wasn't such a uh, removal from any of that uh, at the time, um, although ending up teaching in a, in, a, in a school on the edge of Soweto during apartheid years was certainly a... Um, an unexpected change in, in direction is not necessarily directly related to conservation. However, uh, during that year, we had the school holidays, and during those school holidays, we basically uh, hitchhiked around the whole of southern Africa. And that also took me to some amazing places, quite different to uh, South Africa, quite different to um, places in Soweto. So, we ended up in the Okavanga swamps in Botswana, for example. I ended up on top of Mount Malangi in Malawi, a place I had returned to many, many years later, and ended up spending six, the best part of six years of my life. Uh, we ended up in Namibia, in the Namibian desert. Uh, we ended up crossing Zambia, uh, and even into northern Mozambique, and, and basically all the way around Zimbabwe as well, as well as South Africa along the garden route and the trans sky and places like that. So that year, uh, even though it was not necessarily intended to be a year um, focusing on, on, on uh, conservation and, uh, and, and necessarily exploring Africa in such a way, was really the start of many things to come. And um, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was quite an amazing year. It was a very uh, surprising year in many respects. We were quite naive in a lot of respects, and we ended up in quite a few um, uh, tricky situations as a result of that, but it was a learning curve. It was a life experience. Um, what do you mean by tricky situations? We got into a few, few bits and pieces. We got into trouble. I, I got uh, mugged on, thrown off a moving train at knife point coming out of Soweto. Uh, trying to get to Johannesburg uh, by a gang of 16-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> Were you injured? Uh, I, no, well, I mean, it, well, yeah, not, not really, no. I mean, the, the one person who didn't, who didn't have a knife actually ran. We were coming out of the station at the time when we were mugged, um, and it was the guy I was teaching with. Uh, he was a six-foot Scot. He was, he was the guy I was, I was, uh, he was, he was doing all the work with together. Um, we... 
we were mugged, and, and uh, as we were coming out of the station, the, the train doors were open, um, and a little bit of a, a, a ruckus between us and them happened. Um, and the one guy who didn't have a knife actually ran at us and pushed us out the train doors, um, probably saving our lives. Yeah. Uh, the only, uh, besides our pride, was um, that uh, the my my partner, the the guy I was teaching with, uh, landed on top of me. That hurt. <laughs> <laughs> you'd think you'd be sort of safe as a six foot four Scotsman, wouldn't you? Uh, you would. You would even even as a sort of five foot six Welshman. But uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, anyway. So the the only injury there, besides the uh, sort of shock and uh, the sort of um, yeah. It was obviously a bit frightening as well. Um, the fact that uh, he landed on top of me on the railway track. So, yeah, I mean, that was an introduction to Africa, really. Well, yes, it was, actually. That was my introduction to Africa. I mean, we were, at the time, we hitchhiked around the whole of southern Africa. We were sleeping at the sides of the roads often. Wow. Um, it, well, we didn't, we were quite naive, but we didn't really, we had a, you know, that, the, the hitchhiking side of things was fine, actually. We didn't necessarily get into any trouble hitchhiking. Mm -hmm. um, we had a few sort of uh, rather uncomfortable nights. I mean, I had a, had a, I was, I was on my own coming down back into South Africa from the Namibia through the Namibian desert one one trip, and uh, the lorry I was hitchhiking with was going one way, I was going the other way, so he dropped me at a junction. Mm -hmm. um, and it was getting dark. I had a tent. Um, I tried to pitch it in, in, on this junction in the Namibian desert, which is very rocky. Uh, I couldn't get the pegs in, so the whole tent was a bit sort of collapsed and falling in on itself. I didn't really think anything of it. I looked up to see this black wall of thunder and lightning coming across the desert towards me. I said, right, so I jumped into my tent and got all whatever, whatever, and then suddenly realized as the rain started pelting down all around me that I was um, actually sleeping in a slight uh, uh, concave yeah. dip, <laughs> which then immediately filled full of water. Uh, the tent then collapsed on top of me, and I had <laughs> just sort of in my sleeping bag in about a foot of water, uh, having one of the most miserable nights of my life. <laughs> but it was a very nice sunny morning, and uh, as I emerged from this uh, wreck of a tent, all dripping wet and soggy, uh, the sun was, it was a beautiful dawn, and the sun was shining, and uh, uh, an African pickup, a pickup came round the corner, full of, uh, full, of, full of local people going, I don't know, farmers or something, going from, from one place to another. And I jumped in the back and off I went. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of camping on the roadside in Africa, I know not everywhere is wild, but is it a little bit hairy in terms of some of the animals sometimes? Um, yeah, you can. Well, I'm not so much at the roadside. Now, I have been, I've been chased by warthogs coming <laughs> out of uh, Lake Kariba. And I was again hitchhiking. It was, it was at this time. It's all, all part of the same year. It was quite an eventful year. This one. So, um, yeah, I had my rucksack on and I was hitching out of uh, Kariba at the time and then this family of warthogs sort of piled out and, and the male warthog obviously thought I was a bit too close to his, uh, his little piglets and he, and he went for me and, and I remember running down this dirt road uh, with his warthog hot on my heels. <laughs> um, <laughs> How long did he yeah. chase you for? Quite, quite far. <laughs> I, was quite I was quite surprised. You would, um, but in terms of in terms of running away from animals, then uh, then I think um, African bees are probably the worst. Mm -hmm. I've been chased for over a kilometre by by wow. the same nest of African bees that are, that we've actually uh, 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 disturbed, or they were swarming at the time and found us, and they didn't. They you know we obviously you know, were were were. were they had us in the, in in their uh, in their in their crosshairs, and off they went. And yeah, we ran for quite a long time before they stopped stinging us and following us. Another one of my friends from um, South Africa tells me it's really baboons you have to look out for. It's not lions yeah. that you're scared of. But yeah. um, well, baboons baboons have, can have um, the baboons have got quite uh, hefty um, canines. They they've got quite quite sharp teeth and quite a powerful jaw bite as well. And uh, they are cheeky and they will. They will, uh, they will check you out and they'll watch what you're doing. And, and if you have a routine, they will learn that routine and they'll know when they can come and take things and when they, they'll watch you out the corner, you know, and uh, <laughs> they'll see what you're doing and then they'll come in and, yeah. But uh, some, troop of baboons, some troops of baboons are fairly docile and fairly easygoing and quite harmonious and other troops of baboons can be quite aggressive and, uh, and, and dangerous and they will come in and take and attack and bite different but, cultures um, yeah yeah it yeah. really depends on on the hierarchy of the baboon yeah. 
but true. but so but back to your research how so in terms of your work in conservation um in terms of what you're actually doing uh, are, you, are you looking primarily at uh biodiversity loss that comes about through logging or poaching or are you more concerned with climate con- uh change and this sort of thing or, or what, what's your main well, what focus all, all of it really i mean um biodiversity loss uh, as far as you know what we're dealing with is biodiversity loss i mean uh, as whatever aspect contributes to the biodiversity loss of the sites that we're looking at is relevant and important and uh, we will research uh, whatever is the driving force behind the destruction of um, these biodiversity hotspots these these montane sites these rainforests that um, that we're interested in, which is our focal site. So, yeah, it can come in many shapes and forms. It's not necessarily um, as, as simple as commercial logging, which um, it can be in, in some of the larger rainforest areas, such as the Congo or, or the Amazon, or, or commercial farming, for example, or mono, monocultures such as palm oil. Um, in the parts of Africa that we are working in are the the isolated montane forest patches of southeast Africa, uh, east and southeast Africa, if you like. And um, you can call them rainforests. They are tropical forests. They are wet forests. They're not dry forests and they're not woodland. Um, so they are essentially what you would call rainforests. But they are the remnants of a much larger forest expanse that has retreated naturally um post glacial period and these forests were once connected to the main central congolese uh rainforest belt if you like mm. but they have been retreating and they have been isolate in the small forest montane patches for a very long time so they're small relative to other rainforest patches i mean they're nowhere near as big as anything you'll find in central or west mm. africa um, they're actually very small and they can be hundreds of hectares uh, up to thousands of hectares and sometimes they can be less than 100 hectares. So we're talking about very small patches, but they're high, very high in biodiversity because the plants and the animals that are inside them have been trapped inside these forest patches for a very long time. They, the, the, the rainforest belt that connected the whole of this part of Africa to Central Africa to West Africa started to break up in the in the mid Miocene, which is something like fifteen million years ago, and has been breaking up ever since. So these forest patches have probably been isolated for um several million years at least. Mm. So uh, the impression that I got was that these uh, isolated patches were isolated because they were unreachable to humans, not not that there was this natural retraction of the forest that left these pockets. So so it's they the main the main cause of the retraction there is natural you said not not uh not yes not... Um, uh, yes 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 um the main cause of the retraction uh, the separation of this big rainforest block that covered central southern uh, and connected into western africa is something that started to break up in the mid Miocene 15 odd million years ago as a result of climate change, natural mm-hmm. climate change, pre and post glacial periods. Um, the climate, the planet does warm up and cool down naturally. And this is also leads on to this whole climate change uh, discussion and climate change debate. People often mistake the fact that, um, you know, um, we are saying now that uh, the, the current problems with the with the planet in terms of the CO2 emissions and everything else is as a result of climate change, uh, but it's actually human-driven climate change. It's more what we're talking about. Climate change itself is a natural process, and the Earth cools up, uh, the Earth sort of cools down and heats up naturally over time anyway, but this takes thousands of years. What we're seeing now is, an, is a very sharp rise of um, uh, um, of, of, of temperature rise uh, over maybe a hundred odd years, and that that is not natural. It, well, it's not natural in the sense that um, this is not necessarily driven by um, the sort of harmonics of, of of the natural processes of the Earth. I mean, there's only one variable which is different, and that and that's really the human the presence of of human species. So, 
it, it stands to reason that we are uh, the, the factor which is causing this current uh, climate change. But it's really all about the speed at which this is happening. Um, and the speed at which it's happening means that the natural world cannot um, keep up with this speed, which means that animals and plants are going to become extinct. Uh, because it's happening too fast, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. Naturally, climate change ha is a very slow process that occurs over thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. What we're seeing now is climate change as a result of human um, human influence uh, that is happening within a hundred years. Mm -hmm. So that in itself, um, the natural world is not really able to, and the natural processes and weather systems and plants and animals are not able to adapt to the speed at which that's happening. This may be uh, a little bit of a silly question, but on, on the, I mean, you've been in the field for 20 or 30 odd years, and I'm wondering if on that scale, have you anecdotally been able to, or, or in your, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you're surveying all, all sorts of areas in Africa. I'm, I'm wondering if, there's, if this is something you have personally noticed in, in, in your work. Well, um, well, animals and plants becoming extinct as a result of this human-made climate drive and climate change. Um, well, I think we're still at this point where where um, where the effects of climate change are, are really only just sort of starting to kick in, where we're starting to see these um, these effects. I mean, at Mount Marble, one of the sites in northern Mozambique. We, we discovered the second population of the Namulia palis bird, which is Mozambique's only endemic bird species, and it's from Mount Namuli. And so Mount Namuli is a neighboring mountain. It's one of the mountains that we've also been looking at. So at Mount Namuli, it's becoming extinct because of uh, the forest destruction. It's, the forest is being cut down, unfortunately by local people, because they want to plant potatoes, of all things, in the peaty montane soil of, um, of the humic montane soil of, of these forests and that's the home of the Namulia palace at Mount Marbu where the forest is relatively intact, well it is, it's in good condition and it's still the largest single block of rainforest in southern Africa um, however the bird is only found at high altitude, so it's only found but Mount Marbu only goes up to 1,700 metres so we were only recording the Namulia palace at something like 1,600 metres um, so we are, as, as climate change kicks in and as temperatures rise, then basically this species of bird is going to be forced up uh, in altitude in terms of the environment which it, 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 uh, it has been adapted to. But it's going to run out of forest because the forest is going to stop. So eventually it will become extinct in the, in the sideline. Hmm. On on so on the other side with with regards to um, poaching and logging and that sort of thing, when you're doing your field work, can it can sometimes be a little bit dangerous when you in, encounter poachers and, and, and loggers? I mean, they're just trying to make their livelihood, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we we haven't we normally get on very well with we we, we don't we not go we don't go in there and start you know closing things down or or, you know, trying to get people arrested or anything like that, because uh, the main threats to these forests are very much uh, sort of shifting agricultural ones um, through the local communities that live inside or outside these forests. And so really what our recommendations are trying to sort of just make, uh, trying to install an element of conservation agriculture to try and make mm -hmm. things a bit more sustainable so that um, they can farm and they can provide for themselves, but at the same time they don't destroy the forest, which is also the resource which they depend on. So, um, I, in in a way, because in years gone by there was uh, a much lower population and the habitat was much larger, then um, these dilemmas or these situations didn't really occur because the natural resources were, were plentiful and they could regenerate and they could sort of, you know, absorb this sort of anthropogenic disturbance to a lesser or greater degree. But we've reached the stage now, especially in Africa, where the population is rising sharply, maybe exponentially, and the amount of natural resources available, which not the vast majority of the local population depend on, are greatly reduced and um and disappearing fast and so you have a 
you have a sort of uh, an exponential rise in human population on one, on one side, and then you have a sort of almost uh, a similar sort of decline in natural resources going on in the opposite direction. Um, and and it's you know the natural resources are finite, and and eventually that's going to run out, and then um, yeah, I mean they're going to, and then the local people are going to be in a worse situation in the future than they than they are now. So really, our recommendations are are trying to, in terms of conservation, is trying to work with the local communities and instill an element of community conservation and conservation agriculture that um, can take the pressure off these forests, um, but at the same time make sure that you know people people have everything that they need and that's, say, it's not very it's not easy <laughs> when, when you when you speak to the locals is this something that they're uh noticing themselves is are they feeling this this drop in resources um or is, is that not yeah, felt I think, yet i think they are i mean it depends where you go um we a, a good one to use for that sort of for that sort of explanation that scenario when you when you go and talk to local chiefs or local communities is water 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 is something that you know everybody understands everybody needs everybody uses um, uh, water is extremely important for irrigating crops it's extremely important to drink obviously you can't live without it and so it's something that has this immediate connection with uh, nature and the natural world so what you find are these these forests these wet forests, they sort of act a bit like biological sponges. And, and in the rainy season, in the wet season, there's plenty of water and the rivers are flowing and the streams are flowing. Um, but, it, but then, they, you know, in the dry season, obviously the rains stop. But these forests act like sponges and they absorb uh, the water and they keep the water and they store the water. And also the, the three-dimensional structure of the forest can um, extract water from the air. Um, so it creates its own microclimate. So basically, the, the streams and the rivers can keep flowing throughout the dry season as long as the forest is kept. And so you can highlight this. And in certain places where uh, the forest has been cut down or removed, people do understand the, the importance of putting back the forest or protecting what's left because they see that the water, which they depend on, has, um, has greatly reduced, if not stopped. And so water is a very powerful um, way, communication way of communicating uh, a conservation message. Okay, so, so um, the local populations are seeing what's happening and they're receptive. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I guess a lot of your work must be working then with, with local groups. Um, yeah, we do. We, we always, whenever we go to a site, um, well, we work, with, we work with local groups on, on a number of levels, really. I mean, uh, we work through... Uh, we partner with with uh, with, inst with local institutions or national institutions. So in in Mozambique, we're partnering partnering with uh, about three or four Mozambican NGOs, which are dealing with community engagement, community land rights. Um, we are dealing with uh, um, Mozambican NGOs that are dealing in conservation. Uh, implementing conservation. We are dealing with, for example, the Natural History Museum in Maputo, uh, the, the Department of Agricultural Research, which is a you know, government thing. So we have many government uh, and non-government partners within the host countries that we work in. So we, when we go to a site, we, they, they are, are partner us on the expeditions. So they come with us into the field. So we work together at this site. It's a mixed team of national and international scientists from various institutions. Uh, the international scientists can come from all over the world, from uh, the UK, obviously, to, um, uh, to Germany, to, to, uh, to South Africa, to Brazil, to Switzerland, to America, you know, to Spain, or whatever. So... It can be a truly um, global uh, mix of people on, on our expedition. And then with the national counterparts, when we do go to a place, then we meet, we, we follow the correct procedures and protocol. We go and meet the, the local leaders, the chiefs, uh, the regulars. We sit down with them. We fully brief them on why we're here. And that's very important because they often think that we're looking for gemstones or something like that. 
and uh, we're not. We're here to do conservation. So it's important that we sit down and talk this through with them. Um, and uh, then we ask them to provide us with um, people to work with us from the village. So we will take, uh, for example, a lot of porters to um, go and, and, and supply our camp. So we generally camp above human habitation, and that's because we can then drink the water from the streams and the rivers. Um, because we can't carry enough water for our expedition, so we just drink the water from the stream. We don't need to treat it, we just drink it straight. As long as we're above human habitation, then uh, we, we just drink the water straight. Um, so that can often be a three to five to six hour trek from the local village up into the mountains, up into the forest. I will have done a recce before then. I will have found a suitable campsite with a suitable water supply. So I'll know where we're going, but I'll have found the campsite, and then we go with our team, with our national counterpart, to the local chiefs. We ask him to provide us with uh, local people, which is a mix of women and men, and uh, yeah, and then and then we'll go the next day and we'll go, we'll go up to the camp. We also ask them to provide us with guides to the forest, and generally those guides are, uh, I ask for the local hunters, because the local hunters are the people... For a number of reasons. One, they know the terrain better than anybody else. But more importantly, they know where all the traps are. So um, they they know how to recognize the traps. And the traps can be quite dangerous because they can be uh, these platform bear traps, which are open like that, and you step on it, and then they close. And uh, they're banned in Europe now. They used to be used in, in Europe. They used to be called bear traps. Um, and... They are very dangerous, and they can take your foot off, and uh, very painful, and they use commonly <laughs> very in this, painful. this part. Yeah. <laughs> okay, understatement. Um, they use commonly in this part of Africa, and uh, yeah, so the local hunters know where they are because they set them, and they also know where to look for the signs because they're actually put in the middle of paths because okay. animals will will use paths. So we use hunters, we use porters, we use guides. Um, all of that, and we follow the right procedure, and we go through the village. And generally, before we set off to a, a forest site, then the village will give us a ceremony where they connect with the spirits, uh, the spirits who live in the forest, the spirits who live in the mountain, and they'll perform a uh, ceremony where they ask the spirits to provide us with a safe passage and to bless our visit to the particular forest or the mountain. So... It's quite a, a um, it's, it's, there's quite a few steps. We don't just turn up and, and get into the forest. We have to, uh, we go through the local community, we go through the local uh, protocol, and we, we try and go in uh, with all respect for, for everything that's going on in the local area. Yeah, I, I was quite curious about uh, how you obtained permissions for these expeditions because I suppose in some of these locations where there's been a history of coloni colonialism and where there's been a, a war, for example, in Mozambique, that I, I suppose some of the local groups might be a bit sensitive and, and, and wonder what you're doing and what your intentions are. Yeah, um, no, we, we, I mean, our permission is from the government. So mm -hmm. we, we get permission from the government to go to these places. I mean, that would be the, the host government, whether that's Mozambique, Malawi, or even Ethiopia, whatever. So um, we have the official paperwork and the official government documents to, uh, to give us permission to go to these places, and then we'll show these to local chiefs, etc. Sometimes we have to go through the district commissioner as well. So we go to the regional government, so the national government, then to the regional government. It can be quite a procedure. It can be quite a bureaucratic um, uh, operation. It's, an, it's a bureaucratic expedition before we even set foot on the ground. <laughs> but so, okay, so so in terms of the actual locations you're heading to, so Mount Mabu, am I pronouncing these right? Mount Liko? Yeah. Um, so in terms of finding these locations, what are you looking for? Like when, when, when you go out searching for a, a unique uh, environment, what are the key features you're after? Well, it, it's generally forest in good condition, so intact, wet forest, because that's where, in terms of the animals, you're going to find the new species. You're going to find the animals that are only 
found at that particular site or within that group of mountains. Um, and they are unique and found nowhere else in the world. So the better the, the better the quality of the environment, in this case the forest, the higher chance you will find uh, these endemic species that are found nowhere else. But on uh, in addition to the uh, species that you can find, uh, scientifically, what do these uh, locations give you? Uh, these isolated areas that humans haven't touched. Well, I mean, it's it, we, what we're doing is we are trying to preserve. Um, this is really a, a drive to try and preserve as much biodiversity globally as possible in the in the in the face of. Uh, widespread destruction, uh, environmental destruction and uh, extinction. So mm -hmm. we can't save it unless we know it's there. And so mm -hmm. this is really, this is frontline scientific exploration. I mean, I have to say that, uh, that these forests are being destroyed at quite a fast rate. So um, the importance of finding new species is to provide the evidence base to justify their protection. So in conservation, mm -hmm. there's only a limited amount of resources available to protect, conserve um, areas, natural, natural areas, natural sites. And we have to somehow rank these sites in order of importance. It's sad, but it's true. Mm -hmm. This is the way it is. Uh, we don't have enough money, resources, or manpower uh, to mobilize to protect everything that there is, every, all the natural sites that we are. So you have to generate an evidence base as to why a place should be protected. And finding the new species is really the start of that evidence base. Um, and these new species will be endemic, so these species will be found nowhere else in the world. So by finding these new species, you are generating that evidence base, which you can then use to... Um, create a whole sort of uh, conservation awareness, a management plan, a funding um, mm -hmm. proposal or whatever, you can then bring in focus of international organizations, the conservation organizations. You can then also highlight the national government as to the importance of these sites and why they should be protected, etc., etc. So it's all there to really sort of create the case for their conservation. So the, it's not just about new species, but the new, spe new species are important uh, in that sense. So, so in terms of places like uh, Liko and, and Mabu, uh, these mountains, these Inselbergen, I think they're called, um, how, how rare are these? Were you really surprised when you were able to find these just on a Google uh, search or, I mean, in, on Google Maps? Or is, are, you are, talking, there are, you, are you talking about the forests? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah these these isolated forests that you found. How how uh, rare are these? Are there more that you're planning to go uh, look at? Or yeah, for sure. So I mean, there are forest patches all the way down mm -hmm. the East African coast, from Ethiopia all the way down into northern Mozambique, in a bit in Zimbabwe, and even down into South Africa. Um, they are fragmented and they are isolated. So I started in the early 1990s running expeditions to these forests. Um, at the time, I was working for an organization and uh, the expeditions were three months long and I was doing three a year. So I, I was, and I did it for three and a half years. So for over nine months of the year, I was in, I was camping, and it was rough camping. We 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 made our own camps as we went along. We I didn't um, we didn't have set camps. We we would find a stream and next in a piece of forest, we'd clear the ground, we'd make our camp, and we'd stay there for at that time. There were three months. They were very long expeditions, um, and I did three of those a year for three and a half years. That's, that's over nine months of the year in the forest, and that's really where I learned about uh, working and camping in a rainforest. And also, uh, I've always had an interest in butterflies. That started from the uh, age of seven, when uh, my mother and father moved up from the capital city of Wales, which is Cardiff, mm -hmm. to a mountain in North Wales. And um, the man they bought the farmhouse off uh, left a moth trap in the garden. And there wasn't much to do on a mountain in North Wales at the age of seven. 
So I turned on the moth trap, and that led to a, the start of everything, really. That's led to the start of an interest and a fascination in butterflies and moths. Uh, obviously starting off with British stuff, and then uh, over the years, my mum and dad used to buy me stuff for Christmas, including various other books and butterfly books and stuff. And, and there was one book in, in particular um, that had a picture of, uh, it was a painting, actually, of a, uh, of a man, a young man collecting butterflies in a rainforest, and it was the most magical picture with shafts of sunlight crisscrossing through this cathedral of rainforest with vines and colours and butterflies dancing in sun sunlit lit gaps and uh, birds and everything else, and I thought, wow, uh, I want to go off and do that. And many, many, many years later, I I did, and I have. Well, you've been, actually uh, found your own species of butterflies, right? Yeah, a few actually. I found quite a few. I found oh, I think about eight or nine at the moment. Um, I found I found uh, I think over twenty new species in total. Four chameleons, uh, two snakes, um, three crabs, two bats, eight butterflies, one frog. <laughs> So when when you're organizing these expeditions, you can come across essentially anything, right? You can come across a new mushroom, a new anything you can imagine. So so how do you organize these groups? And I, I heard also uh, you often have volunteers that are going along the, on these expeditions. Is, is this also the case? Well, no, not really volunteers. I mean the the expeditions I started off with those three month ones in Tanzania in the early nineties. We use volunteers on those, but the, the expeditions I run in Mozambique um, are very much the people on the expedition are the the leading experts in their field for this part of Africa uh, for bats or reptiles or amphibians or butterflies, plants, etc., etc. So the people I take are the best in the world. The people I take are, are the experts, and that and they compose of the expedition. So it's a multidisciplinary expedition composed of pretty much experts in their field, in their taxonomic field. Um, and so that's quite nice because there's a lot of experience and there's a lot of knowledge. Um, and so they're very interesting. And so there's a lot of um, bouncing off each other in terms of uh, thoughts, ideas, uh, discussion is good. Um, and uh, the results are also, you know, of, of quality because we, we, I've got, you know, the best people in the world on these expeditions. So they're quite, they're quite good in that, in that sense. It sounds like the campfire talks must be pretty fun. Yeah, well, they, they are, and uh, you know, anybody who survives that long in uh, working in the bush in Africa also normally likes a, a, a good drink of whiskey as well. So there's often, uh, you know, no shortage of, uh, of, of whiskey as well. So that's also quite nice. So yeah, and that helps. That helps. You know, their conversation flows, and, and yeah, quite nice. So yeah, we have fun. In other words, and that, the, the expeditions are fun. So, uh, so it was it Liko that was the most recent expedition. Liko was the most recent full expedition of thirty plus people. I I did a recce in November uh, two thousand and nineteen to a new site. This is going to be Mount Nalumi, which was just me and and, and my colleague. Um, Phil Platts, and we went to check out another mountain for another big expedition. And that was supposed to happen this year, um, but all of the people who fund expeditions have put their funding on hold due to COVID. So um, that will probably happen next year by the looks of it. Um, when you put uh, together yeah. your when you put to together your dream team, how do I sneak onto this? How? <laughs> <laughs> well, to stay in touch, really. <laughs> So well, I wanted to ask uh, specifically about uh, Liko. Um, so this is this is a forest on top of you know 500 meter tall cliff faces, right? H yeah. How do you get up there? What what you know? You've you've got all sorts of members. You also had I read I might be wrong here that you had members of the expedition that were over 80 years old. How how do you get uh, these sorts of people up a 500 meter cliff face? Yeah, well that'll be uh, my my. My dear friend Colin Condon, who's um, who I think is eighty-seven now. Yeah. So he's he's a butterfly expert who has been coming on my expeditions uh, since he was seventy-five. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, but Colin, Colin didn't go up the ropes to Lico, so we had a base camp at the bottom of Mount Lico. Um, and we we were also working another site as well at the same time. So um, there were people on the Lico expedition who didn't go up the ropes, didn't go up to the forest at the top. They they worked uh, the base camp down below the surrounding lands, and there was another mountain site close by that they were also looking at. So, um, but yeah, to get people up, then we brought in expert climbers, and we had we had two of the greatest uh, Britain's finest for for the Lico expedition, Julian Lyons, uh, who's one of the most, Britain's most famous free climbers. He's a, he's a solo guy. And uh, Mike Robertson, also a free climber. He actually climbed the Eiffel Tower in, I think, the late 90s or early 2000s uh, to unveil a banner against the sort of oil company's involvement in, in Myanmar. I imagine um, he so wasn't that, that, allowed to do that. No, that was a legal guy, yeah. <laughs> So uh, it's not, I think it's on YouTube anyway, so you can have a look at it. But it's quite something. He, I think he did it in a suit and tie. But um, yeah, so those two. So they're quite char- they were characters in themselves. I mean, so uh, yeah, they came. I've known uh, Jules Lyons for over twenty years. He's a he's a, he's a friend of ours now. So uh, I mentioned it to him, and he said, "Yeah, sure, he'd he'd love to," because I mean, his, his main job or he is is doing sort of rope access on oil rigs out in the North Sea. So uh, you know. Wait, so he put up the flag against the oil rigs, and then he works for the oil rigs? How? Or is it? This? No, no, oh, no, no, no. Okay, no, 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 <laughs> no. no. That, so you got Jules, and you got you got Mike Robinson. So um, it's do Jules they fight who, over who, this, or? No, no, no. no well, I don't know that. Long time ago. So Jules, he 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 works. He does the rope access for oil rigs, which basically means he he maintains the uh, the structure, um, and he sort of. Um, yeah, you know, climbs up and down and abseils down the legs right down to the bottom of the ocean floor and he fixes them in the dark and all that sort of stuff. Um, quite um, hair-raising work and he, you know, he abseils up and down the um, the outside of these oil rigs in the North Sea as well, all year round. Um, Mike, uh, yeah, in his younger days, he did indeed scale the Eiffel Tower to release a banner against a certain oil company's uh, involvement in, in Myanmar. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I mean, I'm, I'll leave that between those two. <laughs> they can, yeah. I'm, sure they, I'm sure they've talked about it many times. Anyway, they're really good climbers, and they're both um, expert uh, free climbers. So they, they rigged it up to Lico, and the, they were responsible for getting everybody up and down, and they did a amazing job. I mean, they were they were actually going up and down the ropes, I don't know, 10, 10, 10 or 15 times a day. Wow. Um, we thought we'd be able to haul all of the equipment up and down on like a pulley system, but um, we couldn't find an overhang, so the incline of the of the rock was like that. So actually, so those two carried, not only did they get wow. people up and down, they carried all the equipment and camping equipment and whatever that needed to be up and down those rooms. So, hey, hats off to those two. They were, they were amazing. Um, That's something yeah. I was a little bit curious about. I was wondering if they sort of set the ropes and then they had two weeks off and then, but no, they were just busy the they entire were time. Every day, every day. I have to ask something uh, on the non-glamorous side, if that's okay. <laughs> Is that I imagine these untouched environments, uh, you have to protect. So are you also carting everything back out? Like, are you allowed to uh, go to the bathroom and leave uh you know, waste up there, or is everything coming back out? And is that on the backs of your um, climbers? Uh, well, pretty much everything came out. Uh, everything every, we didn't. There was no. Um, yeah, we 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 made a, uh, a latrine on the very edge, uh, not inside the forest, but right on the cliff edge. Um, so. <laughs> That, I see. Does, that, does that answer your question? <laughs> it, it answers the question. <laughs> but everything else uh, was was taken out, yeah. And as yes. only a few people were limited up there anyway, so we were only having maybe four or five people up there at any one time. Okay. And then, like was I said, that, we had uh... we had a we had a bigger base camp at the bottom where everybody where most people were most of the time. So the main camp wasn't on Lico; it was at the bottom. And then and then Lico really was a satellite camp. That we had maybe four or five people at any one point, no more. And, and why was um, that? So, was that so that camp. you wouldn't scare animals away, or what? What was the reason that you kept that smaller? Well, for many reasons, really, trying to minimise disturbance, trying to, um, yeah, 
not to trying not to disturb the environment, uh, trying not to create, you know, trying to minimize our footprint as well as, as, as much as possible. So we didn't have a big camp, we had a very small camp. Uh, like I say, we, we had a latrine right on the edge, so there was no, in, no waste inside the forest, etc. Um, yeah. And then people, like I say, they, a lot of people just camped at the bottom and just came up and down the ropes in the day. So, mm. uh, most people went, 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 if you like, went home at night. They went down to the, to the main camp. Um, so the actual camp on Lico itself was a very small affair. Um, I, I spent most of my time up on the top. Yeah. But so, okay, when you, you, you come over the top of this cliff and you're in the forest at the top, is was it immediately distinguishable from the forest surrounding uh, the, the mountain? Or, you know, did you immediately... Yeah, well, Aliko itself is a, is, a very, is a very small site. It's only a kilometer across. Um, and it's about a thousand meters up. So what we found it was quite interesting really um we found a dry side and a wet side to the mountain mm. and uh and with a bit with a basin in the middle um it was quite mixed vegetation um what struck me about Lico was just how quiet it was it was very eerie it was very silent it was very still that um the ve vegetation wise the species of tree and the plants are species that you get across that part of Africa. Um, so it's really all about uh, the composition and the density and the interaction between the growth rates of the various species and, and how the, so that's all work which is still being analyzed really the sort of uh, the botany, the the soil, the carbon, the the canopy intactness, and they they will all highlight the differences between uh, neighbouring sites and Mount Lico. The actual species of tree, for example, are species you do get across this part of Africa. The what's happening in the soil will be interesting as well. We dug a soil pit uh, where the bottom of the soil pit uh, we had the the soil analysed. Uh, dated back to seven and a half thousand years. So we have a historical record of the last seven and a half thousand years um, in the soil on from Mount Vico, which uh, with, is ongoing research at the moment. So what what can you find out from that those soil pits? That's that's something I wanted well, look, to ask about. You, you can find out. Well, for example, you can you can look at charcoal. So you can see uh, how much burning charcoal content on the soil, you can see how much burning has occurred um, at that site over the last seven and a half thousand years. You can look at the pollen uh, content of the soil, which will tell you what plants and species of plant and diversity of plants, you know, what was the um, vegetation over time at that site and how has it changed. Um, Ah, and then you can look at nutrient content, uh, you can, you know, look at mineral content, for example, and you can assess carbon. So, obviously, carbon is the big thing for uh, climate change studies, and you can actually measure the amount of carbon at different levels going back seven and a half thousand years, which will actually give you a record of a baseline, a baseline natural environment record of uh, carbon uh, at that stage going back seven and a half thousand years. So uh, this is something I, I didn't really understand. What does it mean uh, when you're searching for carbon in soil? Uh, what what it, does that just mean? You're you're searching for um, you know biological things that have come from living things. What 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 does the statement mean? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's, it's carbon content, and that could have come from many different sources, really. So uh, carbon absorbed from the atmosphere, which is then being deposited in organic matter through, for example, root systems or something like that. It could be as a result of, uh, you know, decomposition of organic matter at the same time. So it, it's, it's basically carbon content uh, of the soil uh, at different levels, which indicate different uh, time frames. Um, and that is indicative of the environment or the climate that existed at that time. 
Uh, but the carbon itself could have come from many different sources. But mm. what you'll see, it, it, the, the interesting thing is actually the, the comparison between uh, levels of carbon at different time frames, and then how you then interpret that as to what was happening clim climatically um, and biologically you know, at that time, at that site, and then comparing that to results uh, of similar analysis elsewhere in the world, but also within that region of Africa and in neighboring forests and neighboring mountains. And so it's really how it fits into the bigger picture of carbon data and carbon analysis that's occurring um, through these forests, through these mountains, through this region of Africa, um, and then globally. Mm -hmm. And so how... how deep these pits were quite deep that you dug right indicating that i mean we there was down, very we little down, disturbance yeah we went down two meters and uh we didn't hit the bedrock so the pit could have carried on going deeper um but we ran so, out of time oh so, so it was did, time was the factor not yeah, energy we, we we dug a two meter pit and then we stopped hmm. uh we didn't we were expecting to hit bedrock after about uh, half a meter or even a meter uh, but we yeah. didn't. It just carried on going down and down and down. So that was really surprising. Lika was quite surprising in a number of number of ways, but the depth of the soil um, was surprising. We didn't expect it to be so deep. We thought it would be slightly shallower because of the shape of the mountain. In fact, that it's a, a basin, it's a granite basin, and it, it, it's vol it, it looks like it's a crater. It's not a volcano, but it has that sort of shape to it. And so you, you would expect, um, and we weren't right in the, in the bottom of the basin, we were up near a slope quite close to one of the top ridges. We would have expected that we would have hit, um, hit the bedrock sooner, but we didn't. And in terms of the um, charcoal that you were finding, were you finding that, that there was uh, very, it was fairly routine that there were fires occurring? or we, uh, Well, there were fire events. Um, randomly sort of distributed through through the soil uh, what we found is that the incidence of charcoal increased more in the last thousand years than it mm -hmm. than in the last uh, that between 1000 years ago opposed to over 1000 years ago to seven and a half thousand years ago so in other words the incidence of fire has increased in the last thousand years the reason why I ask is, I mean, you've got an isolated patch of forest that's a kilometer across, say. You'd imagine if there's a fire that you just wipe out everything that's up there. Um, yeah. you know, there's nowhere for animals to get to. So I, I'm, it's surprising that you were able to find uh, endemic species that you don't see anywhere else, actually, in, in some regards. What, what were you able to find? Yeah, I mean, so there were some very surprising things. Actually. So um, it, it's essentially a... Uh, a circular basin. So at the bottom of the basin is where all the water gathers, and that forms a stream which then flows off the lowest point of the crater edge. Uh, and that lowest point of the crater edge was pretty much where we had our base camp, uh, or our satellite camp. Um, and we found fish in the stream. We found crabs in the stream. Uh, the crab has turned out to be new. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fish, we think, is also new. So that's quite interesting. How did the crab get up there? How did the fish get up there? Especially the fish. Um, that was quite can, interesting. How, how well can eggs survive going through uh, the stomach of a bird? Probably fish not very eggs. well, I'm guessing. I'm not sure about fish eggs, really. I mean, you're more likely to get the, the, uh, uh, some sort of water, a bird that likes... Um, uh, um, checking, uh, hunt, um, hunting, and um, looking for food within water courses, and then the fish eggs getting stuck on its feet, mm -hmm. and then it flying off, and then sensing or smelling because he can smell water on the air that um, there's a water source in this nice, cool, dark forest, and then coming down to investigate it, and then the eggs from the fish then falling off the bird feet into the, into the water or something like that. That's more likely than it passing through the gut. Uh, the crabs would have probably walked up. But it's a 500 meter cliff. How do they? <laughs> yeah. Well, they would be, well, where the water flows off at the lowest point would have, um, 
I went there in the height of the dry season and the water's still flowing, which is quite interesting, which means there's a lot of groundwater up there. Uh, as long as the water was, is flows all year round, then the crabs, in theory, can, over time, just go up the rock face, because they, yeah. they're good climbers, Clab, crabs are very good climbers. Um, and within the water, as long as the water's permanent or always there, then they can survive, so they can get the oxygen that they need for the flowing water. And eventually they can get to the top and into the forest and into the uh, forest streams and pools. So yeah. that's probably, well, that's more than likely what, how the crabs got there. They would have come from below and uh, walked up either in the wet season or the dry season or over a number of years, basically up the side of the mountain slowly but surely until they get up into the basin. The fish probably came in on fish eggs on, on bird feet, but there's other, there's other possible ways they could come in. Could, uh, uh, could people have brought them up? Uh, you know, if, if you're moving unlikely. up there to... Ma- and unlikely, because I mean, with, with these fish are tiny, yeah? they're, they're, they're about the size of your thumb. I see. They are, they are but you also ma- found antelope, right? You yeah, found these big... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's a couple of antelope. I got three antelope on the camera trap up there. So, um, yeah, the antelope are up there. And, a bunch uh, yeah. of very inbred antelope. Yeah, very. <laughs> <laughs> but but there, must, there must be, obviously must be male and females up there, otherwise they wouldn't be breeding. So... Um, but did you but do I mean, any it, it, DNA analysis? We took some dung, which we we've we've been analysing. Yeah, um, we need to get some better pictures of them, really. So it's difficult to say on that one image. Um, we got an image, but it wasn't a great image. They look like some form of diker, although we did collect antelope type poo from the forest uh-huh. edge or on the rock face, and that turned out to be Clip Springer, uh, which is your montane antelope, as would be expected in that part of Africa. So the question is, are the antelope in the camera tap image the same? Uh, are they Clip Springer? They might be, but um, they look more like Diker, and so we need some better mm-hmm. imagery. So you would expect Clip, clip Springer on the rocky, grassy, sunny, mm-hmm. fake brick um, cliff faces, um, but Inside the forest, you wouldn't get clip springer because they're not a forest species. So mm. it looks like there's some form of diker up there, but we need we need to look in further in. Mm. But so on the um, on the expedition itself, you you were I, I read um, sorry I've, I've <laughs> I read on up quite a bit on on Lico, so I'm sort of focusing on that. But um, so you were finding. Uh, was it spiders everywhere and, and no bird species? Is is this the case? Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah, no, we were there in May 2019. Um, there were lots of spiders. You wouldn't, that in itself is not that surprising because Lico sort of sticks up in the air uh, with a cap of forest. And so, you know, you get a lot of, the, it's, a, it's an obvious wind trap. Uh, not just for moisture, but also for things that are flying through the air. And so for a spider, then it's, it's, a, it's a natural place for it to, you know, make a web. Um, yeah. there's, there are insects, there's food basically on in the air, in the wind, that's being blown through and across Lico. So you put a web up and you catch it. So over time, you would have got, um, you know, quite a few spiders. You know, they would have breed and be successful and they would, would keep on doing it. Um Birds, okay, yeah. It, the forest was quite quiet. I mentioned that before. It was very still, very eerie. So we were expecting more bird species there, and it's a bit of a mystery as to why there were not so many bird species encountered there. One possible theory could be uh, army ants. So we came across on many occasions, we got bitten by them, um, these, the Doralis, the your Siafu, your, your, your African army ants. And they can have huge colonies, up to a million. So there's definitely one of those, as, um, well, probably only one of those on, on Mount Lika because it's only a kilometer across. And so they can forage huge areas, but they also need a hell of a lot of food to feed, um, to feed their, their colony, to feed their nest. Uh, and they do go up and down trees. So maybe, Maybe they are taking the fledglings of birds before they can 
uh, mature to get, you know, to, to, to go on the wing. Maybe, maybe it's the army ants which are actually, you know, predating mm-hmm. the, the fledglings, the, the chicks, before they have a chance to breed. I see. Possibly. Hmm. So, no, possibly. <laughs> yeah. But so what about it, um, in terms of uh, smaller mammals? I, I, I read you were finding gigantic rats and spiny mice, is it? Or yeah, what, what are these? Pouched rats. Pouched rat is a, is a big, pouched rat is a big, is a big, um, uh, a big rat with a very long tail. They were, but that's, that's not endemic to the uh, mountain, is it? No, I don't think so. Um, Pouched rats were very happy up there. Uh, there were also big, di- uh, big um, uh, darcies, your your hyrax. Uh, they were up on the on the slopes as well. And some of those we came across a skeleton of one of them, and it was huge. It's one of the largest uh, hyrax skeletons, or it must have been a massive thing. Um, which to me would say that there aren't any predators up there. Um, and that would also be reinforced by the fact that the antelope are there. So I don't think, and we didn't hear anything, so I don't think there's leopard up there. Leopard would, leopard would be your natural predator for small mammals and uh, antelope in the forest. And uh, I don't think there's any other any of those there. So there's no predators. So you've got your antelope, you've got your very large hyrax, you've got your quite a few pouched rats running around all over the place um, and then you've got the smaller things like the shrews which are insectivores so they plenty of insects up there loads of insects so the insectivores would do very well uh, we did a little bit of bat netting we could do with doing a bit more bat netting really to see what else we could get <laughs> Um, so uh, I have to ask you then. Uh, so when you're coming across the, the new species, so it's an unlucky day for that particular uh, guy that you find, right? Well, we don't normally know it's new, you see. So I mean, we, I mean, because we, I take the the you know the world's leading authorities in these taxonomic groups. They they are they can see immediately. Um, they they will know if they can identify they they be able to identify it or they won't be able to identify it. Um, so yes, we take a reference collection and and that is important because um, that forms the evidence base that we can then use to justify its protection. Um, and that is unfortunately you know part part of the necess- necessity of modern conservation. You need to prove that um, this site has, you know, these endemic species that are found nowhere else in the world, and uh, photographs are still not enough. Um, there has to be an actual specimen that, that can be put forward um, as evidence, as proof. And so, yeah, I mean, most anything else that we know, we, we let go. So. The good thing is we're not collecting everything that we see. We are extremely selective um, in what we take, and majority of stuff we would let go. Um, so one thing I did want to ask you about is uh, I read that you you found pots up the top. So yeah. there had been people uh, there before. I was wondering, uh, did you speak to any of the locals around the mountain and ask yeah. uh, about what? where these could have come from or do you know where these, these came from now the yeah I mean, so the local people uh, from both sides of the mountain knew of nobody who'd ever been up there so we thought that we were possi- could possibly be the first people to get up there um, which yeah, is, is exciting and daunting and uh, both at the same time um there was talk of the Germans coming and people fleeing up the mountain, but I think that was mainly um, a bit of a tall tale. And what was interesting is because the local people that I talked to said that um, they knew of nobody who'd ever been up there, means that these pots actually predate local knowledge. Um, and the fact that they predate local knowledge could mean that they represent uh, the, uh, they were placed there by a different tribe, a tribe that existed in this part of Africa before the current tribe that lives around the base. Um, there were quite a lot of tribal migrations going on um, 
from Central Africa coming south, etc., uh, over the last thousand odd years or hundreds and hundreds of odd years. So <clears throat> it's quite possible that the people who placed the pots on top of the mountain were a different tribe from the people who, who lived around the base. Um, but Either way, the pots predate local knowledge. So even if it's the same tribe, um, it's it's gone out of their folklore that people have been up and down the mountain. So what do the pots represent? Well, they were found ceremonially placed upside down at the source of a river, not a river stream, sorry, coming out the basin. Um, which signifies quite a lot. That signifies that it's an offering to the gods for water, and that would make sense because the stream flows off the side of the mountain down to the flatlands below, where the local communities are planting maize and agriculture and require the water to irrigate their, their crops. And I was there in the height of the dry season in 2017, in November, and the water was still flowing. So uh, it's quite possible that if the water stopped flowing in the dry season, then people would go up there and make an offering to try and keep the water flowing. And this is a phenomenon known as rainmaking that is known about in southern Africa, and it is known that uh, such offerings have been made from high places and mountain tops um, to to the gods to keep to make it rain or to keep the water flowing. Um, so a village would have had a professional rainmaker, a bit like a medicine man, but this rainmaker's job would be just to make rain, just to pray for rain. And they would have somehow scaled the, the cliffs, uh, the sides of Mount Lico to make this offering. Huh. Did, it, it, any of the groups that were surrounding the mountain, they, they no longer have rainmakers, I'm imagining. Well, the ones we talked to uh, do not know. Um, they didn't know of anybody who'd been up there, so um, they certainly they don't know. They, you know. Nobody goes up there. Nobody goes up there. We don't know. I mean, uh, and carbon dating on the pots? You can't do it. That's the problem. So there's something called optical illuminescence, and there's something called thermal illuminescence. So thermal luminescence can date, uh, possibly date a pot from when it was fired, but you can only date the, uh, the I think the charcoal element to it. And if that pot, if that pot is in a bush fire, it resets the date back to zero. I see. And you start again. Optical illuminescence is an exposure to sunlight. And that's also another dating technique, but that only works from stuff that was found underground or un in the, underneath, uh, the, you know, in complete darkness, and then you can do an optical luminescence of that. So you can only carbon date the organic matter with trapped inside a fired pot, but that date is reset if uh, there's a natural fire that it's uh, mm. involved in. Um, and so it's a bit difficult. So I have to go on the pattern. So the pattern, we looked, we sent it to a few people and they date the upturned pots at about, uh, 300 years ago. Uh, and then we found a fragment in the stream and that is about 1,400, uh, uh, 1,400. AD, so, uh, so eight, yeah, 800, 800 to, yeah, about 1,400 years ago, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's two separate time points, yes, so it there's, might have there's, been... There's, there's two yeah. separate time, time points, so there's evidence of uh, the mountain, Mount Nico, being used as a rainmaker's site going back 1,000 plus years. Oh. I wonder if you'll ever stumble across some uh, human uh, remains or something along like that. Well, the lines like that. God knows how they got up there. I mean, it would have been, um, I guess, we're, they, would, they would have to have used uh, natural ropes made out of vines and whatever, and ladders made out of bamboo or, or bits of wood or something like that. Um, it is, of course, possible to have done that. Um, it would have been quite hairy and dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the pots, would they have carried the pots up or would they have made them up there? Yeah. <laughs>
Hmm. Uh, in in terms of... Uh, the pods are, they're quite big. Really? Okay. Yeah. I, but uh, they're broken, right, as well? No. Um, yes. We found bits of pop in the stream, which were the older ones, but the three upturned pots are intact. Uh, well, one's broken, two are intact. Huh. They're the ones it, which were about it, 300 years ago, so... Um, yeah. yeah. Huh. And I guess if you're going to leave something that's that valuable up there, I, I guess it is an offering or, or you... Yeah. Are there any other circumstances under which people would leave something so valuable up? I guess not. Well, yeah. I think it's the way that they've been upturned. So they're, they're, they're inverted and they're at the source of the stream, which, which all points to uh, or a ceremonial offering. Um, and the fact that they're close to the source of the water uh, points at, you know, water, obviously, and, and therefore rain. Um, or um, else maybe you, you don't want your pots to fill with leaves. I mean, it, it's hard to uh, infer, right? It's uh, Well, it, it would be if it, if it wasn't documented elsewhere in this part of Africa. Mm. So uh, rainmaking is, um, is, is a... Um, is, is a process, is a uh, is a behaviour that has been recorded and documented, and is something which does occur, or uh, you know, uh, over the last hundreds of years, whatever, uh, in African tribes in this part of Africa. So, and and the placing of pots and pottery is part of that, and the fact that it's mm -hmm. close to the source of the stream, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have been very difficult to to live up there. Well, no, you've only got water, I guess, and you've got antelope. So <laughs> maybe, 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 yeah, you just don't bother coming down, do you? You go up there and you stay up there. So. I mean, it could have been a place of safety where if there's tribal warfare. Exactly, or, yeah. It could easily be, know. you know, you, you go up on a rope and then you haul your rope up and nobody else is going to come and get you. It could be quite a nice idyllic safe place to live so um it is possible that people not many people because it was only it's only a small site so you wouldn't have been able to have many people at all but i mean you mm -hmm. might have been able to have a family or something like that but um mm -hmm. possibly you lived up there i mean if you go back hundreds of years then the surrounding lands would have been extremely wild and dangerous mm -hmm. they've been full of lion and rhino and all sorts really and uh and then obviously there'd be tribal conflicts and stuff like that and disease etc 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 so you know parking off at the top of mount Lico could be uh, an absolute pleasure yeah um, and you put an insurance population of antelope you fill the streams with fish you, yeah. i mean yeah. i i can imagine all sorts so back back to the um in terms of, I'm a bit curious about, uh, in terms of some of the species you've been finding, you're up at the top of this mountain with uh, a bunch of really intelligent people. Who gets naming rights? Oh, I see. So, yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't name a species after yourself. Um, you can't, you can name, yeah. Is that frowned upon or it's not allowed? It's not allowed. You, you know, you can't, you can't find a species and name it after yourself. Um... <laughs> You can name it after other people if, if you feel, you know, that's correct or whatever. So the stuff from Mount Lico, basically, uh, I found a butterfly, that's going to be Licoensis. We've got a crop, that's going to be Licoensis. So I think pretty much all of the new stuff that we found are going to be named after Mount Lico. So I think every... Sometimes if you, if you find, for example, two things, like, you know, within a group, two butterflies of the same group, then you, you would be, you know... You call one after the site, and then you'd have to come up with another name, and maybe or maybe not, you might name it after somebody who would uh, merit such a accolade or not. Um, but uh, generally, most of the time, we name it after the site. Uh, so I, got, I found a new snake from Mount Marble, that's called Marbuensis. I found a new bat from Mount Marble, that's called Marbuensis. Um, a new butterfly from Lico would be Licoensis. Uh, found a new crab from Mount Namuli, that's Namuliensis. Found a new crab from Melangi, that's Melangiensis. So, most of the new species get named after the site. Sometimes if the species has particular colors or, you know, features, then maybe you can name, use that to help you name it. Uh, I found a new pygmy chameleon from 
Mount Marbu, and that was named by Bill Branch as Mazzy Pictus, which means painted face, because it had all these colours around his face and cheek and cheeks. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 yeah, naming species is a, is a bit of a variety, really. I have a, a weird suggestion, which is that, uh, you know, in terms of getting funding for conservation, <laughs> I know, I know uh, has anyone ever thought of, <laughs> yeah, is, is this is this frowned upon or is it? Um... Uh, um, yeah, well, it's a little bit frowned upon. I mean, it's, um, I think. Um... But if the survival of a species is exactly. sort of like. Yeah, no, no, it's not, depend- it's not, I mean, it's not necessarily. When you think about it, it's such a bad thing. I mean, it makes no difference to the species. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, <laughs> I mean it, however, I mean, but I mean, if, if that can leverage significant conservation support to protect not only the species but the forest that it's found in, then uh, then why not? I mean, I don't I don't see that necessarily uh, as immoral. Ha- has it been done? Yes, I'm sure it has. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know anything any of them offhand. I don't know any situations offhand where that's that's done. I think uh, is it Goran Goza in, in Mozambique, the Car Foundation. They they fund most of their conservation work. I think there might be a few species named after Car as a result. Um, but I don't think he did that in the with, in the first instance. I think that has been given uh, as an accolade, as an honour for supporting the conservation in the first place. I don't think that was, you know, you, know, you, you, you give this money, we'll name a species. I don't think that happened. I think he, he fit, fit, as part of a philanthropic gesture, he bankrolled the conservation. And then many years later, some species were named after him as a thank you. And I, I think that's fine. I don't think there's any, I don't see any problem. Mm-hmm. So do you have a favorite animal that you found? Is is there one of the 20 that particularly... Yeah, I really like the snake, uh, actually. The, the snake, the Atheris, Atheris marbuensis, is a bush viper. Um, <laughs> and it's one of the first species I found at Mount Marbu. And uh, I actually found it because I stepped on it. And, um, <laughs> and that's, that's one way to find a new species of bush viper, is you step on it. So, uh, yeah. So it wasn't poisonous because it was a oh, python, Oh, it's poisonous. Right? It's poisonous, yeah. It's just poisonous? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a, and a viper, it didn't get you. No, it, it didn't get oh. me. And then, uh, yeah, that turned, it turned out to be a new species. And it was cool. But it, but I like it because it's so beautiful. Because if you look it up and have and, and see the, an image of it, um, it's got these amazing uh, scales, which uh, are almost like dragon-like. And then they're, they're shades of brown and olive. Uh, and and purple, and then they're tipped with gold at the end, and, and it's the most beautiful snake. Um, do Do you have any nice pictures of it? Yes, because <laughs> uh, it might be if it's your favorite of the animals that you've discovered. Uh, maybe I could steal one of those pictures as a thumbnail of uh, of uh, this publication, if 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 that would work. Yes. Um, I think that would be fine. Uh, yeah, I think that'd be fine. <laughs> um, in terms of okay, this poisonous snake that you just uh, stood on and discovered—I've never done that, by the way. But uh, <laughs> um, it, what, is are there other dangers that were up there when when you were uh, on these expeditions? Yeah, I mean, in terms of going into a completely unknown environment. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest dangers in the forest is is, is not stepping on one of the hunter's traps. So mm. that. Um, yeah, there's many, there's many dangers. I mean, snakes are just one of them, whatever. I mean, uh, if you have an accident and fall over, break something, or you're a very long way from hospital, there isn't really any helicopter or maybe back that's going to come and get you. It's going to be a very painful um, and treacherous trip back out and down to try and get you to any proper medical attention. I always take a, a doctor on, on the big expedition. Mm-hmm. Um uh, dangers and the yeah local traps and all that sort of stuff they're pretty bad as well so that's why I use local hunters as guides uh, to go through the forest in one so we don't step on the trap but also so we don't get lost um, so yeah many 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 things really and then there's obviously you know and I get malaria which we do often but malaria over 15 times now so. oh that sounds horrible 
Yeah. So, okay. So at the beginning, uh, you were telling me um, sort of the reasons why you'd want to go on one of these uh, trips in terms of protecting, you know, proving that there are these unique species there that we need to conserve. So, so what has been the outcome uh, at the end of the day of, of these expeditions? What, what, what have, you, have you been able to achieve? Uh, um, any particular protections or? Yeah, I mean, we use the, we work with the media to highlight the results, highlight the threats, highlight, um, you know, the reason for, you know, putting putting these places on the map, if you like. I mean, we can write the scientific papers and the descriptions and everything else, which then get published, but they're only read by, you know, taxonomists or people necessarily, you know, so, or scientists, etc. So it's good to also highlight uh, what's going on at these sites to the international community. Um, and we do that through, you know, things like the Lico expedition and things like that, and Marbu and all that sort of stuff. So what's quite nice is very recently we've just, we are involved with now, we've been given the mandate by the Mozambican government to turn Mount Marbu into a new protected area because it currently isn't one. And we've just been uh, awarded uh, the contract to do that to to create a new protected area. Okay, so that's going to happen. Yes, and uh, yeah, well, that's amazing. Yeah, and and I'm 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 basically in charge of the science, which is lovely. So that's all. That's really quite special, especially to me, um, because it's where it all started really in 2005, yeah. and then. 15 years later, we've now come back around in a circle where uh, the biggest and the bestest uh, in terms of the forest area, Mount Marbu, um, we are now being given the mandate to, in, in the next few years, to turn it into Mozambique's newest protected area, which is very special. So, success. Well, congratulations. Yeah, that, really <laughs> really, uh, that's, that makes everything worthwhile and means that everything that we've done has um, people have eventually listened and has been good. It's been a success, and so the endemic species, the new species, are all part of the evidence base, the justification that will be that we are now using to create Mozambique's newest protected area at Mount Mars. I th that, that's a that's a nice uh, positive point to sort of uh, wrap up this story on a little bit. I think I, I, what I what I want to do is I sort of wanted to ask you um, uh, towards the end, uh, sort of your 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 dreams uh, for the future in terms of of, of uh, conservation in in uh, Southeast Africa, and also um, in addition to that. What people can do to help? I mean, what what are the what are some things? If, if people are interested in in, in uh, the, the work that you're doing, is there is there any way they can get involved, or what what can people do? Well, uh, yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, I mean, um, okay. So one thing that we will, I mean, you can come and visit these sites. So uh, nature-based tourism is plays a role. Nature-based tourism provides uh, an income to the local community um, as guides, as porters, etc. So for Mount Marble, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a visitor center, uh, a research center. We are going to be creating a list of local people who are going to act as porters and local hunters that are going to turn into guides. And people that will be able to come and visit Mount Marble and walk through the forest and experience you know, what it's like to walk through South, Southern Africa's largest rainforest. Um, and we're going to organize all of that. And we're going to have, uh, you know, a base, a visitor center, you know, some, some camps, some trails, um, and, uh, you know, create a sort of nature-based tourist destination. So um, there's that. If people want to come uh, on holiday <laughs> and, uh, and walk through the forest, they can. Um, in terms of uh, support for other other sites, really, it's it's more of an awareness thing. Really, it, it's trying to um, generate enthusiasm, interest, support to to convince.
convince the Mozambique government that uh, these are very important sites, to convince the international conservation uh, authorities uh, or conservation organizations that they should also look at these sites, that they are important, that they are sites of high biodiversity. And uh, Marbu is just the beginning, and, and really we need to create new protected areas for all of these montane sites. So I'm involved now uh, writing a paper, which I hopefully will publish later this year, that wraps up the last the results of all the last 15 years of science work and expeditions in this part of Africa. Um, as a result of the results of all of these, these, these studies, we now have, I think, sufficient evidence to... Um, yeah, to, to link all of these montane sites into one eco-region.